What a terrible thing to do. I have something special to share with you today. It's actually really fun and interesting, and I think it will be very memorable for you. This is a lesson where you are going to discover a lot about English, about the nuances of English, ways we can communicate even more of our message beyond just the part that's contained in the words themselves. So today we are going to learn English with a story. And actually, it's a comical story that I think you will really enjoy. And at the same time, you will be able to realize a lot of things about English at a very deep level. Now, before we get started, I want to make sure that you know that compared to a lot of other languages, English makes pretty elaborate use of intonation to carry part of the meaning. So say you've got a sentence, right? Part of the meaning of that sentence is contained in the words themselves. Let's say maybe 80%, but there could be 20% of the message that is not in the words themselves, but is actually in the way we say those words. Now, if you are an English learner or an English lover, I am sure that you want to understand as much as possible about that extra, I don't know, maybe 10 or 20% of the message that's contained in the intonation, right? And this lighthearted and fun story will actually allow you to take away some quite serious and memorable lessons about the patterns we have in English intonation that signal specific meanings. If you would like your own copy of this story, I also have a PDF for you with audio and my notes for what I'm emphasizing and why. Just check the description. It's completely free. Now, if you're new here, my name is Dawn and I love sharing English with non-native speakers who want to understand more of the meaning and the English they hear and communicate more effectively and also joyfully in English. So if that sounds interesting to you, then make sure you're subscribed to my channel because I think you'll really enjoy the lessons that I share here and the English explorations that we do here. Now we're going to learn English with a story and we are going to learn a lot about some very specific intonation patterns in English, right? So first let's talk about what intonation patterns we're going to be observing, analyzing, and understanding more deeply in this story. Well, one thing we're going to notice is pauses. So when you look at a text, it just looks like a wall of words, right? With some periods and commas here and there. But we actually use a lot more pauses than just the ones represented by the punctuation. And we use pauses for different reasons. We break our speech into chunks to help the listener process what we're saying and understand the structure of what we're saying. And we also use well-placed pauses sometimes for anticipation, drama, and impact. So once you have your chunk of speech, you will notice that some words are emphasized more than others. In English, we have a tendency to stress content words and reduce function words, but that's not the whole picture. But in any chunk of speech, there will be one word that's emphasized. Most of all, that's where our pitch shifts, and that's called the focus word. So we're going to see many instances of that in our story. So you'll notice that the focus word, we're putting it kind of up on a pedestal where it will get the spotlight. It will get the focus of attention in that thought group, in that chunk of speech. That focus word is where we present new information for the listener to notice what's the most important element of new information in this chunk of speech. And then we do the opposite thing in English when we have old information. And this is really important because 
Most other languages do not operate like this. So you need somebody to let you know that this is happening in English so you can start to notice it and get that extra meaning from it as well. When we have something that has already been mentioned, it's not new information anymore. It becomes shared information or something that we can call old information. And old information comes down off that pedestal and it goes down into the shadows. And we use a very low tone of voice to de-accent it. We take away the accent and it drops down into the shadows. So that's something very interesting that you'll get to observe in this story. De-accenting of old information. Now, when old information is de-accented, it's down low, but one word has to pop up to take that focus position. And so you'll notice that when we have de-accenting of old information, we'll have something else pop up to take that place on the pedestal and become the new focus word. So you will also see that in this story. And there's another concept that is extremely important in English speaking, which is contrast. More than other languages I'm familiar with, English is very sensitive to any type of situation where there could be an implied or stated comparison or contrast between two things. And we have to emphasize that with our voice using a special intonation that you will hear in the story. And I think it will be very interesting to you and maybe not the way you would have expected these sentences to sound. So isn't it great when something is different than you expected? That means you have a chance to learn something there. And then there's one other pattern that I want you to be aware of, and it's called a set phrase. And that simply means a compound noun that's stressed on the first element. Usually these are two nouns together like birthday or cell phone, but in some cases it could be an adjective noun combination. That's a very specific pattern that exists in English that most people who come to English from another language need a little help recognizing. So we have all of that that we are going to get to observe and see how it all works together in a fun, charming, and really memorable story. So let's jump into the story. Confessions of a superhero. Here's our first instance of a set phrase. Superhero is a compound stressed on the first part. It's not superhero, it's superhero. Confessions of a superhero. You see how low you hear, how low my tone goes at the end. I'm stressing the first part and de-accenting the rest. Superhero. Yes. So, confessions of a superhero. To be honest, I felt very proud, as if I were a famous rock star. Set phrase, rock star. I liked being a superhero. Now here, I'm going to say, I liked being a superhero because we are entering this story in the middle of the action and it's already been mentioned that he became a superhero. And now he's discovering, hey, I like this thing that's already part of the context. I liked being a superhero. All over the city, there were signs welcoming me and people waved when they recognized me. Marilu was purple with envy. So welcoming me, we don't normally stress pronouns. So I don't say welcoming me. I don't say when they recognized me, we reduce pronouns, we de-accent them and we stress welcoming me. So let's do that again and jump in and join me if that feels good to you. And all throughout this reading, there will be moments when it might feel good or right to you to jump in and practice and I want to encourage you to do that. All over the city, there were signs welcoming me, and people waved when they recognized me. Marilu was purple with envy. I take that short sentence, and I want to make an impact with it, so I 
chunk it small and stress three things. Marilu was purple with envy. You hear those three chunks? Marilu was purple with envy. Yes, the city of San Bartolo Chico, Michoacán, was, as its name announced, quite tiny, but it had a lot of personality. Do you hear all of that? When you hear an English teacher say that in English we reduce function words, this is what they're talking about. All of those words going quickly and lightly before personality, but it had a lot of personality, but it had a lot of personality. So it had beautiful one lane bridges, shiny six story skyscrapers, very short five meter towers. Even the people were small. Now, do you hear this? This is very special intonation that's particular to English. Even the people were small. So we were already talking about small things, right? Tiny bridges, tiny skyscrapers, short towers. The idea of small has already been introduced. So the idea of small things is not new. It's old information. So now when we mention it again, we are going to drop down and de-accent the word small. And popping up into the place of the focus word is the word people. Even the people were small. Even the people were like the other things in the city that we already mentioned were small. That's really low, but that's where we de-accent. Okay. The only thing that stood out for being big was the vegetation. Did you hear me emphasize big? That's contrast because it's contrast with small. Contrast goes way up and back down with a little hook. The only thing that stood out for being big, big, <laughs> yes, the only thing that stood out for being big was the vegetation. Apparently, they loved flowers and trees. There were thousands of plants on balconies and roofs, inside cars, and even poking out of women's hats and handbags on balconies and roofs, pause, inside cars, pause, and then I have a long chunk I'm going to do together, so I'm going to go quickly in the beginning, and even poking out of women's hats and handbags, set phrase, handbags. A set phrase can be written as one word or two. In this case, handbags is written as one, but it's the same intonation pattern as if I said cell phone or lunch break. Okay, I see you like plants. Do you hear that one focus word? The last content word in a chunk tends to be the focus word, and that's true here. I see you like plants. I see you like plants. Do you hear plants getting the spotlight? I see you like plants. I remarked at the jungle spectacle that could be seen on all sides. Oh no, we hate them, replied the lawyer in a serious tone. You hear those last words of the chunks being the focus word, right? Replied the lawyer in a serious tone. Then why do you have so many? Now, here I could imagine two possible readings of this. My choice would be, then why do you have so many? I am de-accenting so many because we've already discussed that they have a lot of plants, right? And the question in my interpretation is really, why do you have all these plants? Why do you have so many? Why do you have the thing that is part of our shared context? So I'm going to de-accent it. Why do you have so many? But it would also be another possible interpretation of this line to say, then why do you have so many if you want to emphasize the great quantity? So that's a possible interpretation, but it's not my preference. I would read this. Then why do you have so many? Now listen to the lawyer and you are going to hear something really special in English that I want you to pay a lot of attention to. We don't have them. They have us, he clarified. They've taken over the city. So did you hear that first sentence there from the lawyer? We don't have them. They have us. We have contrast in this sentence. And it really does need to be read this way. Because in English, we just have to stress contrast. And if that contrast intonation is missing, it feels like something's really missing. So we're contrasting 
we don't have them. This is your mistaken idea, and I'm going to contradict it with the reality, which is a contrast. We don't have them. They have us. So a contrast between we, them, and they, us. We don't have them. They have us. Do it with me. We don't have them. They have us. We don't have them. They have us. He clarified. They've taken over the city. What? Now here, what means, what did you say? And so it has a rising intonation. And so what rises? What? You see, the problem started over three months ago in a supermarket, set phrase, supermarket, when a carrot attacked a woman. This is how I would read it. I would probably not say when a carrot attacked a woman, because woman is a noun, and we normally stress nouns, but this noun, a woman, is such a generic word for a person that we probably would not emphasize it. We would treat it almost the way we do a pronoun. So attacked her, attacked a woman, when a carrot attacked a woman. But there would be another possible interpretation. You could put woman up on the pedestal and give it the spotlight if you wanted to. So you could say the problem started over three months ago in a supermarket when a carrot attacked a woman. So that would be possible. It wouldn't be the way I would read it, but there's room for many interpretations in this story, right? Okay. What do you mean it attacked her? Do you hear that? What do you mean it attacked her? It attacked her is old information, right? It's repeated information. It goes down low. Something else pops up to take that focus word position. What do you mean it attacked her? I asked in surprise. And you notice that when I say the word asked, I don't say asked. Sk-t. That's too much. We don't like three consonants in a row. And we normally drop one. When we have three consonants in a row, we'll drop one. And we would say asked. So I asked in surprise. Well, actually, it just nibbled on her nose a bit. But even so, it was still very rude of the carrot. Okay, now, did you hear some contrast intonation there? Listen again. Well, actually, mm -hmm, did you hear that special actually going way up high and back down with a hook? Well, actually, so this is the reality as contrasted with what I just said with the word attack. That was perhaps a bit exaggerated. So to contrast with that, actually, it just nibbled on her nose a little. But even so, it was still very rude of the carrot. Now, do you hear me chunking that last part small? I don't want to say it was still very rude of the carrot. No, when I chunk it small, it allows me to stress more words. It was still very rude of the carrot. Now, maybe you're thinking, Don, we already mentioned carrot, so it should be de-accented, but you're stressing it. Yes, that's my option. I could have said it was still very rude of the carrot. It was still very rude of that creature I already mentioned. That's a possibility. But I chose to take that carrot and put him back up into the spotlight because I want to be more emphatic. So that's my choice as a speaker or a reader who interprets this text. It was still very rude of the carrot. I'm putting that carrot back up in the spotlight to examine him again, right? I was still very rude of the carrot. That would be my choice for how to interpret this. What a terrible thing to do. Now here you can see that principle in English. This is one chunk, one thought group. I'm not breaking it any smaller. And everything goes really quickly and lightly until you get to that last word, because that's the focus word, general principle. The last word is not always the focus word, but it often is, and that's the case here. And so we're gonna go quickly and lightly until we get there. What a terrible thing to do. You wanna do it with me? What a terrible thing to do. What a terrible thing to do. What a terrible thing to do. And that wasn't the worst of it, said the lawyer sadly. Two days later, in an open air market, a group of vegetables attacked several customers. Now, 
maybe I want to be very emphatic. I can chunk this small and emphasize a lot of things. A group of vegetables attacked several customers. I could do that. Vegetables attacked customers. A group of vegetables attacked several customers. Or a group of vegetables attacked several customers. That's another possibility. I think I'll say, two days later in an open air market, a group of vegetables attacked several customers. I want you to listen for something special. Contrast, see if you can hear it. One man, <laughs> I think I gave it away. One man got a piece of broccoli lodged in his chin and they couldn't get it out. So did you hear the special contrast intonation? One man, because he is one of a group. So of that group, he's the only one. So we use contrast intonation to say, one of this group, not all of them, but just one, one man, you hear it? One man got a piece of broccoli lodged in his chin and they couldn't get it out. That's awful. And notice on the word awful, it's spelled with a W, but I don't pronounce that W. I don't say ow or anything like that, just ah. That's awful. That's awful. The same thing happens with my name, Don. So you see a W, but you don't pronounce it. You don't say down or anything like that. You just say Don. That's awful. Hmm. It's not so bad. Now the man, did you hear the contrast? Now the man, way up high, coming back down with a little hook. Now the man has a nice crop of broccoli on his face. Now, why did I use contrast? Now as opposed to earlier. Yes, English is that sensitive to contrast where things that you might not even think of as being contrast, we're very sensitive and we highlight them with our voice. So once you start noticing that, you might notice that there are more contrasts in life than you are really thinking about. I don't know, we'll see. Now the man has a nice crop of broccoli on his face and sells it for salads. But the thing is, but the thing is, Look how fast we go. But the thing, but the thing, I have two THs. I'm not really going to move my tongue very much. I'll keep it right there, ready to go between the first one and the second one. But the thing, but the thing, but the thing, but the thing, but the thing is from then on, hmm, I could say from then on, or I could say from then on, either one of these would work. But from then on, the plants and vegetables of San Bartolo el Chico have behaved worse and worse. Did you hear my pause? The plants and vegetables of San Bartolo el Chico. And I pause because I wanna give you a chance to anticipate. What do they do? What do they do? Have behaved worse and worse. Now here's a sentence that could be interpreted so many different ways. I don't even know which one is my favorite. Let me just try out a few and you can tell me if you have a favorite. I've never heard of a vegetable doing anything like that. This is probably how I would read it. I've never heard of a vegetable doing anything like that stuff you were just talking about, de-accenting old information. But we could also say, I've never heard of a vegetable doing anything like that. But we could emphasize the word anything. I've never heard of a vegetable doing anything like that. So now anything like that thing that you already mentioned. I've never heard of a vegetable doing anything like that. So which do you like? Do you have a favorite? How would you read it? Now this little passage is very interesting, but that's the crux of the matter. They're not vegetables. They look like vegetables. They taste like vegetables. They smell like vegetables, but there's something else. So what's going on there? but that's the crux of the matter. Matter is a noun, but it refers to the situation that we've been talking about. So it's old information. I'm not going to stress it. I'm going to de-accent it. And then up pops crux, but that's the crux of the matter. They're not vegetables. And I'll give a nice dramatic pause after that, right? They're not vegetables. Now here is something crucial in English. They look like vegetables. We have got something that happens actually a lot. We've got a combination of contrast and de-accenting. 
this happens a lot because we already mentioned vegetables, so it's old information. And there's a contrast. They look like them, but they are not. So we've got contrast up here and de-accenting down here. They look like vegetables. They taste like vegetables. They smell like vegetables. But there's something else. Yes, now we don't normally stress pronouns, but I'm giving a little rhythmic beat to the word there because English loves alternating stress. So if I just said, but there's something else, I feel like I'm sort of missing an opportunity for better rhythm, which would be in English, but there's something else, but there's something else, but there's something else. So let's do it one more time. But that's the crux of the matter. They're not vegetables. They look like vegetables. They taste like vegetables. They smell like vegetables. Pause. But there's something else. Good. Now listen to how he asks the question, what? What? I asked fearfully. Now here, when the boy, it's a boy that became a superhero. Here, when the boy asks what? He's not saying what, as in what did you say? He's saying what, as in what are they? So there's something else. <gasps> what, I asked fearfully, monsters in disguise. Did you hear my dramatic pause? If I just said monsters in disguise, where's the drama, right? No, 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 no. I'm going to say monsters in disguise. What else would they be? The blood froze all throughout my body and I broke out in a cold sweat. Now I'm gonna emphasize blood and froze. Two words right together. I don't do that very often, but I wanna be very expressive with this. The blood froze all throughout my body and I broke out in a cold sweat. Get ready to reduce some function words. And what are you planning to do? Do you hear all of that going quickly and lightly until we get to the focus word at the end? And what are you planning to do? I asked, frightened. Yes, frightened. You just say fright, hold the T. These are your teeth. This is your tooth ridge. You say fright. You stop the T, fright. And then you go through your nose for the next syllable. Frightened. Frightened, frightened, if you want to do it like me. But you can also say frightened if that's easier for you. I will say, I asked, frightened. The lawyer looked at me with a smile. I don't know. You are the one who's going to solve the problem. That's your job. This is my interpretation. I would choose to read it. You are the one who's going to solve the problem. I don't know. You, this is contrast, you are the one who's going to do the thing that we're already talking about. So I would choose to de-accent the one who's going to solve the problem. You are the one who's going to solve the problem. That's your job, contrast. And I'm going to de-accent because we're already talking about whose job it is. That's your job. But there are other possible interpretations. You could say, you're the one who's going to solve the problem and put problem up on a pedestal, give it the spotlight. That's another valid interpretation. I remembered the tragic fate of my uncle and got so dizzy that I thought I was going to faint. That's why you're here, the lawyer reminded me. Getting rid of the mutant plants will be your first case. In an instant, I wanna stress all, I wanna give it emphasis, all the glory I had enjoyed in the previous minutes came crashing down. Me? Me? Up against a bunch of crazed plants? Now here's something really important. I didn't like vegetables. Vegetables is de-accented because we've already been talking about vegetables. So it would not sound right according to the rules of English to say, I didn't like vegetables. Not in this context, because you want to say, I didn't like the thing we're already discussing. I didn't like vegetables. So that's old information and the new focus word. I didn't like vegetables. Heck, not even in vegetable soup. Do you hear the contrast on vegetable soup? Not even in vegetable 
soup this other way you can have vegetables, not even in vegetable soup. My sister smiled when she saw the agony on my face and my mother. Now this is a different person than my sister. So I'm going to put a little contrast intonation on mother and my mother who was ignorant of the true dangers of the superhero world only commented, be very careful, Paco. Vegetable stains are very hard to get out. I don't want you rolling around with those monsters all day. Do you hear me? So it's going on here. My sister smiled when she saw the agony on my face and my mother, contrast, who was ignorant of the true dangers of the superhero world. This is my personal interpretation. So true dangers of the superhero world, you could consider this as shared contextual information, in which case you will de-accent it, who was ignorant now ignorant is popping up to take the spotlight who is ignorant of this stuff that you and i both know about ignorant of the true dangers of the superhero world only commented be very careful paco vegetable stains there's a set phrase the stains of vegetables vegetable stains vegetable stains are very hard to get out i don't want you rolling around with those monsters all day do you hear me Yes, mom, I'll be careful, but with or without motherly advice, with or without, here's another place where English would mark some contrast, with or without, with or without, and then a little pause, but with or without motherly advice. I had my first run-in with the monsters that very day. Yes. What do you think? What do you think? What do you think? So I would love to hear if this was illuminating for you. And I want to ask you a question. What was the most surprising thing for you in what I just read to you? Was there some place where I did something with intonation that you were really not expecting? That would be super interesting to me. So if that's the case, please leave me a comment. I am so curious to know what surprised you in my reading of this story. And also if you had any favorite lines. And remember that I have a PDF for you with audio. If you think that this is an interesting lesson, share it with somebody else who would like it. And I would even say, find a partner who would like to read this story with you. And let me tell you that a few weeks ago, I invited people from all over the world, native and non-native English speakers, to read this story for me. And so I have gotten this story read to me so expressively by people from so many different language backgrounds. Each person gives a different mood and a different flavor to this story. It's been so interesting and so enjoyable to hear all of your stories. So thank you for sharing them. And if you would like to do a reading of this story for me, download the PDF, it's in the description, and you will see a way that you can send me a recording of your reading. I will be so thrilled to receive it. So I hope you've enjoyed this. Thank you so much for spending this time with me. Take care, be well. I'll see you soon to continue this conversation.